Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA A Plus Certification Training Course on Input Devices. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to go through the requirements from our Essentials Exam 220-701, Section 1.8, where we need to install and configure peripherals and input devices. And look at all these different input devices, everything from the things you would expect, a mouse and keyboard, all the way down to some newer input devices like biometric devices and touch screens. We'll also learn about how to use a KVM switch and how that changes how we're able to get information input into our computer. One of the most common input devices that we're using these days is a keyboard. Makes sense, but installing the keyboard, especially on our newer keyboards, you may run into a situation where the keyboard may have two different connections coming out of it. A wired keyboard may have, or the, the wireless connector that is associated with the keyboard might have a mini DIN port. Some people refer to those as a PS2 port because the PS2 computers from IBM that came out many years ago were one of the first computers to use the tiny little mini DIN ports that you see almost very commonly everywhere these days. But it might also have a USB port on this wireless connector or the keyboard itself. You use one or the other. The reason there are two ports there is some of older computers may not have USB ports available, and so you may want to use that mini DIN port to be able to plug in the keyboard. Now, most keyboards will work when you just plug them in, they work perfectly. But keyboards like this, you'll notice, have a number of additional features and capabilities. There's a volume up and down. There's these function keys that you can define and program yourself. So there may be additional drivers or additional software that you need to install into your computer to take advantage of those customized buttons. If you're finding those buttons don't work, it's probably because that computer doesn't have that software installed. The mice that we use are also very common input devices, but very similar to the keyboards, they might also ship with both interfaces on them. They have mini DIN or USB ports. A really, really, really old mice use the nine pin serial port on the back of our computer. We don't see many of those anymore. Newer optical mice these days, they don't have moving parts inside of them. It's all done with an LED display or a laser display inside of that mouse. Sometimes you need a right, the right surface. Uh, for instance, if you're using one of those optical mice on a glass tabletop or a tabletop that has glass on top of it, you may find that that particular mouse doesn't work on there. There's even mice that are specialized to be used on glass tabletops these days just because those optical mice sometimes have a problem with that. Barcode readers are used many places than just at the grocery store these days. We use them internally in many enterprises to be able to keep track and do inventory. So you're seeing them more and more just plugged into people's computers. Again, it's using similar technology to our mouse and our keyboard. We're finding a USB port, sometimes a PS2 type connection or a mini DIN type connection. But almost always with our latest generation of barcode readers, it's using that very ubiquitous USB connection to be able to do that. Because there is a scan or a laser in there that's used to scan this, if we're not seeing the laser, then we know something isn't quite right with the drivers that we've loaded or the barcode reader itself. So it's very easy to do troubleshooting on something like this because it's very visual. If you have a separate reader that you can plug in, you can get that visual display and see, am I seeing that red line come out of the barcode reader? And you can swap back and forth and at least get an understanding of, is the problem with my barcode reader or is the problem with the drivers that I've installed inside of my computer? Especially with USB drivers, you're never quite certain. So it's good to have a separate reader somewhere nearby that you know works properly. You could do some testing with that. One of the fastest growing input devices for our computers these days is digital cameras. We're seeing them everywhere. There's so many different types of visual of digital cameras that do not just pictures, but also do video and audio. They're becoming this all-in-one device in the way that it operates. We're very concerned when we use these cameras of things called the pixel density. We see it referred to as megapixels. This particular camera has eight megapixels. So the more number of pixels, the more cl uh, clear and crisp that picture generally is going to be. And that means we can expand it and make it a much bigger picture and have much more resolution inside of those pictures. These will generally use a storage medium called Compact Flash or Secure Digital. We're seeing a lot more SD, Secure Digital cards these days than the older Compact Flash cards. The older uh, 
cameras will still use the CF or compact flash, but almost everything these days is moving to a secure digital. Sometimes you'll run into environments where it's a, a very customized or a very proprietary storage format. Sony, for instance, has very specialized formats. So you may not see CF or SD. You may see another type of format in there as well. You can't always just plug your camera directly into your computer. Sometimes you'll need extra drivers loaded on your computer. There may be extra software required to get that information off of the camera and import it into your computer. So you want to make sure that you read the instructions and the documentation for your digital camera. Make sure you have the proper drivers loaded on your computer and all the software that it's going to need to properly transfer files both from the camera and back to the camera again. Webcams is also a very popular digital technology these days. It's even being built into our mobile devices now. When you're working on a computer, however, if it's not built into the computer itself, it's usually connecting with a USB connection. We need a lot of bandwidth for video to be able to go back and forth between that camera and the computer, so USB does a pretty good job of that. This is usually used for live video, but sometimes you can use a webcam to actually record and store information. Some of the newest webcams will do HD, and so it becomes a good replacement for some of the normal cameras that you might be accustomed to putting on your computer just to get some of those higher resolutions. So as time goes on, we're rapidly shrinking down and making more powerful those webcams. You'll see with many laptops, this is integrated right in. We don't have to worry so much about uh, buying a separate webcam and putting it on our monitor and finding the right place for it. It's just built in everywhere we go. We have a webcam built into our laptops. Those generally don't have all of the functionality that some of the larger webcams have. But if you're mobile, you just need something to be able to talk back and forth with somebody face-to-face, -face, so to speak. It's a great way to do it. We used to use tape to record almost all of our video, but increasingly we're just using digital formats to be able to record our video. The latest uh, generation of these cameras are quite remarkable. They have uh, HD capabilities. They have HDMI ports built in right to them. You can plug right into your television and watch what you did. They usually will have a hard drive inside of them. That's the camera that I'm using right now has a hard drive. Some of these have built-in flash memory. They might use CF or SD cards. It's really a great way to record because you can instantly review what you are looking at, decide if you'd like to delete it or not. And a number of these cameras even have editing built right into the capability of the camera. Generally, they're plugging into your computer through a couple of different ways. You may have a FireWire connection. It may say IEEE 1394. It may say iLink, or it may have another connection on it. But they're all the same thing. They're all FireWire. Some of the higher-end cameras generally have FireWire connections. It could have HDMI, very similar to this digital camera right here, where I can plug directly in via HDMI and at least see the video that's going on. It may also have USB connectivity, so I'm able to transfer the USB information, the files that I've stored on that digital camera down to my hard drive, and then I can edit that with a third-party piece of software. This brings up a good point about transferring information back and forth. We have now collected pictures. We've got video. We're doing a lot of things with the different media that we have on these systems. Generally, we transfer them through some type of wired connection like FireWire, USB, or using memory cards. In fact, many of printers these days have compact flash, SD, XD, other types of proprietary memory stick type configurations you can plug right into a printer. It'll find all of the pictures on that memory, and it will allow you to see them on the screen, allow you to print them out. It's one very simple way to do it. We're also seeing a, a lot more uh, wireless type connectivity. It's more of an emerging technology, but you can even get things like SD cards that have wireless built into them. When you take a picture, it's going to try to find some place around that has a wireless connection, and it's going to transfer your files up to perhaps somewhere on the internet that everybody would instantly be able to see your pictures. We want to also think about long-term storage of these. If you have them on a camera, it's usually a very limited amount of storage space. We want to be able to take this data and, of course, transfer it off. But then how do you store it? Do you have backups of this data? Uh, video requires a lot of space to be able to back these things up. These are things you have to think about when you're acquiring this technology and planning to use it in an enterprise, that it's a little bit different than using it in a home type of environment. You want to be sure that you're planning not just the ability to get and transfer the information, but also store it for a very, very long time.